Thank you for coming today. My name is Gu Kimchi. I run the Prime Air team. Uh, we started the project years ago at this point. Uh, I used to have more hair. Uh, no, it's actually, I, I, you know, I've been losing my hair for years. And, uh, we wanted to, hopefully you enjoyed the dawn reveal uh, just a few hours ago. That was sort of maybe a surprising, uh, you know, configuration that people didn't see before, surprising capabilities that uh, you didn't expect. Well, we've been working on this for literally years. And this is the culmination of uh, the work of a very talented team of aerospace engineers, scientists, roboticists, software engineers, hardware engineers, mechanical engineers, etc. Um, and what I wanted to do now, because you saw the reveal, is maybe provide a little more detail, maybe double click, if you will, into two specific areas of the technology. And just to give you context, the technology you're working has three main themes or threads, if you will. We build a unique aircraft that's designed to, do, to operate uh, on, in a unique location. Uh, it has to be safe in your backyard. It has to be completely trustworthy. Number two, we have to make the aircraft autonomous. That's a big part of our safety story, but not the only part. The aircraft itself is also designed for safety. And we have to integrate that aircraft into the national airspace. That's next gen in the case of the US. There's a project called UTM, Unmanned Traffic Management, uh, which is a big part of this. We are a member of that uh, effort. And in Europe, there's a project called Cesar U-Space, which is the equivalent there. And there's some work happening in ICAO, which is the UN organization that manages international aerospace standards. Uh, there's also three operational threads that we think about. We have to build the drone from the ground up to full systems and then manufacture it. And we also think about end of life. How do we recycle components? There's a whole value chain, end to end. We have to integrate with our fulfillment operation hundreds of buildings. Just think about that scale. It's, uh, it's a big system and, and the team is working very hard to figure out how to deeply integrate and efficiently integrate with our logistical network. And well, obviously we have to operate the aircraft. We operate basically like an airline. Um, and we have to maintain continued airworthiness. This is a key regulatory term that says that not only are you safe to begin operations, you are safe every single minute you're in the air. Okay, however, I'm only gonna talk about the two <laughs> black ones, and I'll leave some other things for the future, maybe more reveals uh, in future months and maybe next year. I, I would note that although these three areas are called operational threads, there's a huge amount of engineering happening there, and this is maybe a shout out, we are hiring. Mm, okay. Uh, let's start with the concept of operation. Uh, this is sort of an aerospace term. You don't actually start with the requirements. The requirements are derived from the operation that you'd like to perform, and they're called the CONOPS, the con short for concept of operation. So here's like a little cartoonish version of this. The drone will take off. I mean, we love the old drone, so we put it there. Uh, the, uh, the drone will take off from the fulfillment center, will climb to altitude, will transition into forward mode, basically aeroplane mode, uh, transit towards the destination, and now the, one of the tasks that are paramount to design the drone uh, you know, is obvious. You can only proceed in a mission if the airspace is free of obstacles. Some of these obstacles talk to you, like other airplanes, ADSB, TCAS, other technologies. Some of these obstacles don't. A bird doesn't talk to you, right? You still have to look at the world and make the right safe decision. So we have en route, uh, sense and avoid. And I'll provide some details on how that works. We reach the destination, we transition back to vertical mode, we descend after we detect where the delivery area is. This is important because you may get deliveries, but your neighbor may also get deliveries. GPS coordinates just aren't precise enough to tell the difference. So we have a set of technologies that can differentiate very precisely and very accurately between your backyards or front yard, wherever you're getting your deliveries and your neighbor. As we descend, we look at the backyard, we look at the immediate area. This is not like a mapping project, it's just in that focus area where we're about to deliver and we make a survey. We understand the structure, the 3D geometry of that backyard, and we make sure that we understand it well enough that if anything changes as we proceed, we know to abort. We have a special treatment for people and animals. We like them. We like to stay away from them. And there's a whole set of algorithms who are just specialized at finding them and staying as far away as possible. Um, and finally, if everything worked, there you get your package. Now, as a customer, you're now happy, all is good. We now have to do everything in reverse. That's our problem. 
about your concern. So I'll start with the first theme of this presentation, which is a unique aircraft for a unique mission. Uh, to design an aircraft system, I'll, I'll just throw the alphabet soup of things that we have to deal with. This is sort of the shock and awe moment. You want to play in aerospace, this is what you have to become an expert in. Each one of them is an entire discipline. And we spoke about the concept of operation up on the point. And I'll provide some examples of what we're doing in some of these domains. I'm not going to dig, dig into all of them. Um, but uh, you know, that just gives you a sense of the complexity of building uh, such a system. Uh, we think about designs as coming in three prototypical categories. There is an informal design. You pick components, you put them together, you test them as a black box. They work or they don't work. Uh, that's fine. People have been building uh, robots and airplanes like this for many, many years. Uh, there is a limit to how much efficiency you get out of this, such a design, and it's very hard to know how it will fail. What are the failure modes that are embedded in that black box? So then there are formal designs. Formal designs try to take every component that was tested and certified and audited and continue to be evaluated all the time. You have supply chain compliance and manufacturing compliance and requirement compliance and flight tests and test data compliance. And everything has to work perfectly together. But you're still picking components that have been designed by themselves. And finally, there are co-optimized designs where every part of the system, from the raw materials to the bolts, to the carbon fiber, to the aluminum structures, to the software, to the hardware, to the sensors, have been co-designed to perfectly fit each other. And that's what we've done. This design is co-optimized and co-designed. Every part of the aircraft is designed to fit perfectly with every other part of the aircraft. The autopilot is custom. The INS system, inertial navigation system, is custom. The propellers are custom. They both have to provide the right performance and the right noise acceptability, etc. And that control that we have over technology end-to-end -end means that we can control the quality and therefore the safety of our system. So the latest design, you've seen it. I'll show the video again and again, if you didn't have a chance to look at it again. Uh, I just love how that aircraft flies. It's so fluid, it's so smooth. Uh, it's a hybrid design. It's efficient and fast. Credibly robust in gusty conditions. That's one of the biggest issues with multicopters. They just aren't that good in wind. This design is solving that completely. It seamlessly transitions between vertical mode, wing bone mode, so forward flight, aeroplane mode, and back to vertical mode. That turns out, turns out to be a hard problem. That's been, you know, people have been working on this, NASA, if you look at YouTube, at all archives, for 50, 60 years. You look for hybrid designs. And we think we have a unique configuration that just seamlessly transitions. It's completely no effort, no drama. And it has this unique six degrees of freedom control capability that allows it to move in any direction. Now, I'll, I'll maybe use my hand as an example, right? So how many people here have flown a drone before, have seen a drone fly? Most of you, okay. So let's say I have the drone hovering in the air, okay? And I want to translate, move from A to B over here. I'll have to move it a little bit, increase the thrust, right? Now the thrust vector is pointing that direction. Now it's gonna push to the right. Now I have to slow down, so I have to point it in another direction. Now the thrust vector is over there and stabilize. So you end up doing this little thing, okay? That's a four degree of freedom maneuver. If you have six degree of freedom, the drone will just go, because it can push in any direction. Now a four degree of freedom drone, if it gets pushed by the wind, will do this, but it can push in another direction. So you'll have to do this to fight it. A six degree freedom drone, gets pushed by the wing, we'll just push back and just sit there. It's a shrouded design. The shroud serves a double purpose. Number one, it is the wing. And as we've been building dozens of drones uh, over the last years, uh, we realized that the shrouded design is much better than not shrouded design. I'll provide maybe some visuals to, to, to make this clear. Uh, but we also knew that we want wings because we want to be efficient. Now, wouldn't it be perfect if the wings are the shroud and the shroud are the wings? That's sort of the best case scenario. And we managed to find that perfect combination, and that is this other craft. There are no moving parts other than the motors and the propellers. They just, and all, the only thing we control is the RPM, the speed, and the control surfaces, which are conventional aircraft control surfaces. 
It's the minimal number of moving parts that you can have. Less things that move, less things to break, simpler design, more reliable design. Often we think about redundancies of systems. We have multiple things, but then how do you handle all the failures? Sometimes the simpler design is the more robust design. This is what we think is the case here. Okay, that's actually what it looks like. Our, our mechanical engineers gave me a nice little animation. You can think about the thing rotating. Um, and one of the first observations is that, oh, that wing, that shroud, makes it look big. And that's true, it doesn't make it look big, right? So I asked them to, you know, take the wing off. And this is actually what it looks like without the wing. And, you know, we, I, I have a little trick that I do in a lab where I take a tape measure and I measure the distance from one motor hub to the other motor hub. And then I'll go to like a commercial camera drone, one of these things that can carry a big camera that Hollywood loves to use, amazing machines. And I measure, and it's about an inch, like almost the same. Now, we do have that big body in the middle because it carries a big package. This doesn't carry a camera. I mean, it does carry sensors to remain safe. But the main job of this drone is to carry a big box, an actually pretty big box, okay? So the entire drone is built around the box, which is why the body looks boxy, so I had to. Now, of course, this doesn't have the advantages of flying efficiently at high speeds. So then, it does look small, but you know what, I, I don't, you know, even though this is a mannequin, I'm not actually happy with that mannequin being close to propellers. I'd like to have a shroud. It serves a purpose. It serves one more layer of protection in our safety mechanism, the physical layer, and it's also the wing. No wasted features on this aircraft. Everything serves a purpose. So there's a huge amount of work that goes into designing uh, this aircraft. Uh, there are analytical methods. Uh, you know, if you want to do some searching, there's something called blade element theory, which is what aerodynamicists love to use to predict how things work. There's computational methods, like computational fluid dynamics, and you often see NASA release these beautiful images of how the air flows through uh, airplane structures. There are mechanical analysis, like finite element analysis, that tells you, and I'll give you an example in a second, that tells you how the me mechanisms will interact when they're uh, actuated and move around. Uh, Aeroelastic, how does the air affect you? Servoelastic, how does propulsion affect you? Aeroacoustic, how, what kind of sound do you produce? Right? And why do you produce the sound? There's all these models, and this is important because uh, our program is a model-based engineering program. Everything is a model. Engineers talk to each other, teams talk to each other through these models. We validate these models. How do we validate them? Well, we validate in simulation. We optimize them and optimize with them. Right? There's a nice duality that's actually pretty interesting. Uh, how do you know which one is, is the model right or the simulation right? That's one of these fundamental questions that's very hard. We do system modification that tells you how the aircraft will actually uh, work and it does your model match the aircraft, okay? Uh, finally, verification against the requirements or the specifications and validation against the CONOPS, against the actual custom requirements. Now, I put a little note in the bottom. It sounds like we're doing all this work, but actually what the team did is something that I think is brilliant and I'm happy that I didn't come with this. I have a very, very small team. They said, hey, let's build a system that does this. So one way to think about our system, it was designed by AI. We've designed the system, the system designed the aircraft. Yes, we have an aerodynamicist. He's a super, super smart and nice guy. But this aircraft was designed by the tools, not by him. That's unique. Most aircraft are designed by people. People just sort of, the, the complexity of the of airplane and then the complexity of a robot is very, very high. Computers are really good at crunching for these giant trade spaces, hundreds of parameters and all these things and find exactly the right combination that makes them work. And maybe let me provide some example. So one set of tools are analytical, mechanical domain, right? So here's a little simulation. Uh, one of the things you really want to make sure that happens well is that an aircraft lands, it lands safely, right? It doesn't flip over, it doesn't get pushed around. So you can build an aircraft and land it millions of times, and then every time it breaks, you sort of fix it and plan for it, but it's much better to do a simulation. So in this case, there's a simulation of the aircraft, the full aircraft with its full propulsion, and you run it for a large sweep of wind directions and landing loads and the viscosity of the grounds of how sticky or how smooth it is, uh, and you find out that your models are actually working. 
Now, of course, you still have to validate these models in the real world. And I'll provide some examples of how we do this. The almost obvious one is flight test, but that's not the only one. MDO, uh, multidisciplinary, multi-objective design optimization, right? So optimizing for a single objective is straightforward. What if you have to optimize for multiple objectives at the same time? What if they, they don't actually interact positively, right? So if you change one dial positively, let's say you make the weight of the aircraft less, then another dial, another design, uh, objective function becomes worse. Let's say, I don't know, the noise gets worse. Okay, so now you have to find that combination that balances all these parameters. There are hundreds of parameters. Okay, that's really, really complex. Huge amount of computational quantity. So I, I picked just one uh, as just like a mental, like an image to, to show you how we work. So this is an example of one specific trade we did, I'll show the number later, but there's a lot of trades that we ran. Um, this is one specific trade, uh, and what you're seeing is the Pareto font, which is all the viable, con Pareto basically font in uh, optimization is all the viable configurations, right? All of them satisfied enough of your objective function ranges. Uh, and this compares size versus sound annoyance, how annoying the sign is, versus mass. And yes, sound annoyance is an actual objective function of our design tool chain, right? We only select from configurations that are less annoying. So if you look at it, there's some configuration that are sort of really sort of massive, they're heavy and they, they're sort of, maybe they're less annoying, but uh, sort of like this one, yeah, we don't like this one. But sort of these two, right, they're promising, right? The, the sort of interesting, the, the, like the data speaks to you in an interesting way and then now you can choose to go and drill in, double click again if you will, and try to run deeper and deeper analysis. Eventually you say, you know, this is promising, let's build a prototype and actually see how it works. And that's how the design uh, chain, uh, tool chain works. And there are all these sort of uh, uh, trade interpretation tools that the team have built that allows you to understand exactly why a certain, how does one objective function interact with a different objective function? What's actually happening? Un Unpacking the black box. Why did the algorithm say that something is better and something is worse? And often what you find is that the algorithm is wrong, right? Because it's not calibrated with the real world. So you go and use some other, you collect data in the real world and you calibrate the algorithm with empirical data and you rinse, repeat, and eventually you trust your models. Computational method. Uh, we do a lot of computational methods. Um, the, the state of the art here really improved in the last, I would say, literally two, three years. There are things that we can do today uh, that will predict the performance and the stability of an aircraft that we, I, I don't think were possible even five years ago. Um, here's one example. This is a propeller that begins to actuate. And you can sort of see how it's pushing air, the initial push of air, um, what you're seeing, sort of the, the velocity of the air. Right, you can see the little sort of thing falling off it. Uh, and then sort of as it's churning through its flow, it's now behaving very differently. So the initial low advance ratio, it's working in clean air, and it works one way. And then suddenly it started to work as this churn air, and it works very differently. And the point is not to produce beautiful graphics, although these graphics, I'm sure a lot of you have seen them before, and they're really pretty. Uh, the point is that it allows us to understand very deeply the physical phenomena that we have to manage, either to optimize or to control. And you can do it at an incredibly high scale and incredibly high fidelity, which you just can't do by, with physical measurements. There's not enough hours in, in the year. Uh, and we, this extends to the entire aircraft. So here's a, another example of the aircraft going through an inbound transition. And you can see how every surface is interacting, how the outside air ahead of the aircraft is you know, basically undisturbed, behind the aircraft is disturbed, how all the flows are sort of connecting. You can see some of these flows. If you look at this pop, you can see suddenly the flows are going sort of from behind and back in. And this is critical data that your control algorithms are gonna need to know how to manage the aircraft at any time. Because this aircraft is designed to be efficient the, the, all the, the controllability that we have, the, the beautiful way it flies, so fluid, is not because of brute force, it's because of nuance. It's because of understanding the physics behind the aircraft in, in a great, great level. System modification uh, and margin. This is sort of a big, uh, how well does your 
does, does your control model matches reality? And do you know how much margin you have? Which, in other words, do you know how much wind gust you operate, how fast or how slow, et cetera, et cetera, right? What are the bounding performance conditions of your system? And I chose just one graph, examples of this, uh, and maybe sort of point, look at the bottom right uh, as the example. And you see a lot of these lines. And actually what you're seeing is the aircraft taking off, transitioning to forward flight, landing, taking off again, transition for flight, going back home. This is one, what we call an AB mission, a, 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 B, a mission. You go from A, you fly to B, you go back to A. But you see there's a lot of lines there. Each of these lines represent one simulation, one whole simulation running the actual control software for the a fake mission, for a, sim, a, a physical simulation engine. And in each of these distinct simulations, you perturb the model. You change the velocities, you change the wind direction, you change all kinds of parameters. It's a parameter sweep, if you will. Um, and the interesting thing in this specific report is that all these trajectories, they may move around a little bit, but they all result in the aircraft going from A to B and successfully going back from B to A. There are no divergences. We get to test the margins of the aircraft and performance of the control so software well before we ever fly it. And of course, then flight test is important, but the purpose of flight test is to tell you that the world has agreed with everything you've said so far. And I, I think one, one thing that it was really helpful for us is that we decided that we're gonna do this at scale. Um, and again, I, I would say flight test is great. It's really important to know that what you're building actually works in the real world. And it gives you high precision data Right? It's, it's, very, it's correct. You know it's correct because the world either agrees with you or did not agree with you. But it's not scalable and it's not robust because you can test a lot of scenarios. So this combination of analytical and computational method that gives you scale and empirical methods that tell you that you're not lying to yourself. So we evaluated before getting to that design the new aircraft, we evaluated 50,000 configurations. We'll have time for questions in the end. Uh, thank you. We ran over 30 million hours of CFD, and one of the things we discovered, which you know, was funny, is that you could use AWS as a giant supercomputer. So can you, it's just AWS. Uh, and it's also, it was, uh, you know, the team initially was like, well, we have to get all these computers. Like, AWS is a supercomputer. It's like, oh yeah, it is. Right? And they start to use AWS. And guess what? You can, you can rent a supercomputer for a few hours, test a giant, giant work, and then give it back to the, to the cloud for the next, next customer. And that, that was, that number being great. Um, we had millions of what we call full simulations. They actually are, the tool is called full sim for full simulations, where everything is, uh, the, the world is virtual. You can think about it as a little game world. Uh, but everything is correct in terms of the software that's running and the control software interaction with the world and the sensors. And I'll show you some examples later of that. Uh, we run tens of thousands of hardware in loop simulation. This is really important because you know your software is correct, your, your models are correct in the full simulation, but will it work on the actual hardware? Unless you run on the hardware in real time, you don't actually know. And finally, we collected tens of thousands of real world data sets. Again, these empirical data sets that tell you that all your models, actually, the world is in agreement with you. That's very, very important. So, as I keep saying, all these methods are great, but they're uncalibrated against reality. The world is this ultimate decider. You know, you, you do things that are computational and then the world will vote. Either it agrees or disagrees. You must close the loop. And the more often you close the loop, the better your system becomes. If your model is computational without closing the loop, then you shouldn't trust your model. So one way we close the loop is on communications. We have a very compact and very complex system. It has a lot of components talking to each other. So we build our own RF chamber. We test everything without ever you know, having to go outside. And when something interferes with something else, we know exactly, we have a heat map of exactly which connector and which antenna and which components. Uh, again, a, a big pain to, to build this capability and to learn to use it, but imme just immensely useful that at every part of the design, we can just say, I wonder what this change will do. My simulations predict the following. 
Let's see what the world thinks. We also go to the wind tunnel. This specifically is a picture from the Christen wind tunnel uh, that the University of Washington runs. It's been around for many years. It's a fantastic facility. We get to use it like any other uh, aerospace uh, organization. Um, this is an 80% scale model of our design uh, because it was too big to fit uh, in the wind tunnel itself. Uh, what's unique about this, it's an actuated design. It actually, uh, prop uh, the propulsion system is active. And that's actually pretty interesting. Usually you test in a wind tunnel without propulsion. We actually sweep, the parameter sweep we do in the wind tunnel is both unactuated and fully actuated. Okay, other thing is that aircraft starts in vertical mode and then does this rotation. Again, we, it's just software. There's nothing like actually rotating other than the aircraft itself. And it flies and it rotates back. So wind tunnels have this thing called a sting. It's down here, generally. You notice the sting is missing because the sting doesn't support a hybrid aircraft because people just don't build hybrid aircraft. They're complex. Uh, so we had to build our own sting. It turns out for our rotation, we had to put the sting on the side. Uh, so that was a pretty interesting investment. Uh, mo mo you know, stings and wind tunnels are calibrated over years. It, it's a, it was a sort of a fascinating, fascinating project. Uh, one of the questions we get offered is about noise. And usually when you talk about noise, you talk about the power of the noise, right? How loud is it? What's the noise level? Uh, generally called SPL, or there's also a DBA model, which is sort of the A-weighted uh, decibels, which is how a human perception system perceives the sound. Um, it's important, but is it the right metric? And we have a mental model around this. Uh, this is an aeroacoustics sort of domain. Uh, number one, you have to make the aircraft safe. There are certain, uh, albeit industrial, noise levels. Uh, for example, OSHA will say that people cannot be exposed to more than 85 dBAs for more than eight hours. Any more than that, more exposure or more level is un unsafe. So you have to be safe. Now, that's an industrial standard. It may not apply, may not, not, not apply here. But we know there are a lot of standards there, and we have to comply with them. There, is no way that anything that the drone will produce will ever be dangerous. We make self drones, including the sound. Number two is you have to make it more and more and more and more acceptable. And this is part of our design chain. That's really where the, the magic sauce is. And maybe I'll do a specific example. So we'll do a test. I'll play two sounds. And you tell me which one bothers you more, OK? Ready? Yeah? OK. Okay, yeah, that's a, you laugh. Uh, oh, they like it. <laughs> but here's the point, which one did you find? Okay, that, I, I know the answer, right? You, you probably enjoyed the second one and did not enjoy the first one. That was a dentist drill. That's the sound uniformly not li loved by anyone. Um, and we all experience it still. But, but this is the interesting insight. And we actually done, done both computational work and customer uh, surveys and customer studies to know that this is true. The character of the sound matters a lot more than the level of the sound. Turns out that there are five metrics that describe this character. Loudness is one of them, yes. But then there's sharpness, roughness, fluctuation strength. Sharpness is how sharp it is, right? High notes are worse than low notes. Roughness, it's cherny. Think about the sound of a like a ventilator. <laughs> Fluctuation strength goes up and down versus being stable, and tone and prominence are the certain tones that we are impacted by more than others. And these five metrics will basically tell you if people are bothered or not bothered. Now, of course, step one is make it safe. But then once it's safe, there are other metrics that a DBA or SPL metric actually doesn't predict how people bothered or not bothered. And here's the point. We actually designed for it. We took these five metrics. We built a, something called a semi anaconic chamber. Semi means that it has a, you know, one of the surfaces. It happens to be the, the floor surface down there. It's actually concrete, so it reflects. And by the way, that makes the chamber twice as large, which is cute, but requires calibration. Lots, a long story. Uh, that's actually one of our sound engineers uh, uh, 
working and setting up. And what, what you're seeing is uh, you're seeing a, a motor and a propeller and a lot of microphones sort of in a calibrated rig. And once a year, we'll take this rig and we'll drive to the open desert and we run the same test and the same control points and then we'll bring it back and run this test again. And now we can create, basically uh, know that whatever we capture in our chamber is correct in the real world. Again, you close the loop empirically. And what you then do is you can, uh, you can allow customer studies and change the parameters and see what, what works better and what works not worse, right? I mean, which tones, which styles or character of sounds are more acceptable than others, and which allow you to sort of create this empirical customer uh, correction to our models. But then that also means that we can run our computation models directly. So here's an example of a computation model, that same prop in the same chamber, now actually producing a sound pressure. And what the tools can do is now they translate this sound pressure into these five metrics. And that's, a, that's ingrained, that's deeply embedded inside our optimization system. Are we, do we have it perfect, perfect yet? No. Is it better every time? Absolutely. The drones you've, you have built today is the most acceptable we've ever built. And the next one after it will be even more acceptable. The team is continuously improving. This is just how Amazon works. Every day has to be better than the last day. Okay, I'll do a final example on the aircraft configuration side, and then I'll sort of segue to the other part of the presentation. Uh, FTA, fault tree analysis, is how you model everything that may happen to the aircraft. There's a, this big, giant tree, and sort of I, so th this is a big part of the tree, not all of it, right, up here. And then I, I highlighted a small subset of the tree, it's still way too large. And what that small subset, by the way, represents is um, Everything that may happen in the backyard at a certain point, and all the decisions, and uh, all the events that may occur, and all the decisions that one will have to do if these uh, events occur, and then you look for common failure modes or single uh, string events, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? You try, you make sure that, um, that nothing interacts in a negative way, uh, and basically you do this mapping. You make everything into known events. I know that I'm going to fly a customer to a, uh, a package to a customer's backyard. I know that the backyard may be available for the delivery or unavailable for the delivery. I know all of this, and I can prescribe exactly how the drone will behave. That's a known. There are also known unknowns. We, we have propulsion motors, electric motors, on our drone. We do a huge amount of work, analysis, and something called a fleet leader program where we run drones, uh, motors off the aircraft well ahead of anything we operate in the real world. We collect thousands of hours you know, before the drone ever has to get that, that deep into the, the reliability of the motors to predict how they'll fail. And we have prognostics on aircraft. If the motors get too hot or they behave incorrectly, the aircraft will understand it and abort the mission, come home, allowing the motor to be replaced. But we also know that all the work will, may not work. We still may lose the motor. That's a known unknown. You know that you lose a motor at some point. You do all the work to minimize that risk, but eventually you will lose a motor. Statistics, the world just catch up here. Okay, so there's a treatment for the known unknowns. Most important though, when you build a truly autonomous system, a system that's independently safe, that you also have treatments, formal treatments for the unknown unknowns. Things that you never expected the system would be exposed to. And maybe I'll close the presentation later on um, with some examples. Okay, so number one was the aircraft. Other part is the aircraft has to be independently safe. Okay, we generally consider three classes of drones. You heard Jeff Wilkie talk about it, so I'll run through it. Remotely piloted drones, autonomous but blind drones, and then our drone. All the safety features on the aircraft. The sensing and algorithmic uh, approach is diverse. Multiple sensors working in different physical way ways, and then multiple algorithms working in different computational ways working in parallel. And we like to think about it as, as more like a horse and less like a car. So do you drive a car? Ever drove a car? Ever drove in a car? If I sit in a car and I accelerate towards a wall, the car will listen to me and hit the wall. Anyone here ever rode a horse? Few people? Excellent. If you rode that horse towards a wall, what will the horse do? Throw you off. The horse is independently safe. That's what we'd like our drones to be. And that's actually really important. 
the, there's a few things that, it's a truly autonomous system. There's no more confusion. The drone will make the safe decision, regardless of what command it gets, regardless of what the environment uh, may do to it. Uh, one effect is the communications are not safety critical, because all the safety features are on the aircraft itself. Uh, the other part uh, is that uh, the drone can basically react to events that you've never seen before. At the core, don't touch anything. Okay, so let's talk about what it actually looks like. Mental model, diversity and redundancy. You hear a lot about redundancy in systems. If I have three systems and I can lose a few of them and the system stays operating, but if they're exactly the same, they may share common failure modes. Okay, so how do you solve for it? You have diversity. It's not an all, it's an end. So an example of diversity is having infrared sensors, long wave IR, if you want to get geeky, and visible spectrum. They perceive the world just like our eyes, but they work differently. One measures chrominance and luminance, and the other one measures heat. Okay, they, inter they, they perceive the world in a different way. That's sensing diversity. And then you have algorithmic diversity. We may run a photogrammatical algorithm, doing stereo, let's say, and you may run a deep machine learning algorithm, deep learning algorithm, and it just works in a different way. Now, that's some examples will come later. Safety is prioritized over mission success. Sometimes, remember, three states, known, known unknowns, unknown unknowns. Sometimes the, the system is in a state which says, I don't know if I'm safe to proceed. The right decision is, then abort. There's no confusion, right? The complexity is really high. The decision is really, really simple. The vehicles are dependent safe. The missions are absolutely planned to be clear, and we don't trust them. Drone continuously scans the environment, continuously looks around, makes sure that everything is still safe. Yes, your database may say that there's a building site and there's no construction crane, or the construction crane was on the left, and you show up tomorrow and the construction crane got moved to the right. The world has changed. The drone is safe. You are safe. Finally, uh, human safety is of the utmost priority. Everything, every decision uh, we make is uh, based on a simple idea. Don't touch anything. It's really at the core of the drone. You can think about a lot of concentric circles with huge amount of AI. And at the core, this nugget, don't touch anything. Everything you do is about not touching anything. This is the core of our safety. It's so extreme that if you send a drone a command that tells it to touch something, it'll just not touch anything. It's like, but I can't go there. It's pushing me back. That's at the core. Okay, how does it actually work? So on the left, we have sensors. Yeah, both lefts. Uh, sensors are cameras, thermal sensors, sonar uh, sort of uh, sensors, etc. And they feed raw data to a perception system, a, you know, a very, very, very complex and advanced set of algorithms and computers running uh, in real time on the drone. Everything I'm talking about is on the drone. The drone doesn't have to talk home to remain safe. All these algorithms are resident. Uh, a lot of pre-training done to the models, the algorithms running on the drone to make sure that we can observe correctly what the world is telling us. Is there an object close to me? There isn't. And these observations are passed as high-level guidance. Okay? This is important. It's, there, there is no black box like a machine learning model that holds the stick and flies the drone. That, that's just not the way it works. There is, there is a consultant sitting on the side saying, I think I see the world this way, and I have my professional pilot, my autopilot, that's been incredibly, built to be incredibly robust, that flies the drone responsibly. Okay? And these two systems work with each other. So, oop, sorry, apologize for that. There we go. So, that's sort of this observation layer. And finally, there's the actions. The actions are simple. And I'll show you some example in a second. Uh, this is really important. There, there's no complexity. That, in, that there's a huge amount of complexity on the left side of all the AI. There's no complexity at all on the right side. Right? The word we like to use is determinism. Determinism means a lot of things, so we don't throw it around carefully, but that, that's our approach. Two key metrics are evaluated by the autonomous system all the time. Uh, usually I don't read the slide. This is the case where I read the slide because it's so important. Is the airspace safe, allowing us to continue the mission? That's super important. Otherwise, if we, the airspace is not safe, or we can't ascertain, we are not sure the airspace is safe, fly home. Sometimes we actually can't even fly home, and we'll find a safe landing. I'll show you how we do it. Uh, and then, as we need to get closer to the ground to deliver the package, 
is the ground safety approach. Okay, and just to give you sort of a, a sense of this model, and I highlighted one of them because I'll give this as an example in a second, there are scenarios, and then there is a building block, an autonomy building block, or more than one, that gets invoked when you actually have to make determination. And then finally, there is an action. So for example, the, one, the bottom one that I highlighted, let's say the climb path is not clear. I'm in the backyard, I've delivered the package, and now to fly back home, and something is above me. I shouldn't climb up, right? So there's an algorithm, actually a combination of algorithms that, that tells you that the climb path is clear or not clear. Binary answer, right? We know you can climb, you can't climb, or we don't know you don't climb. Both, these, both of these later things are no, don't climb. And then there is a prescribed action in our fault tree, in our, in our design. Wait, if you can't wait any longer, find a safe urgent landing. The complexity of the AI system is real. There's a huge amount of, of algorithms there. The decisions are very, very simple. They can be explained just like the, this is literally the level of decision, the way the drone is programmed. Okay, so we talk about the climb path clear. So this is roughly how it works. There's uh, certain algorithms uh, that, uh, in this case, two algorithms. One is a deep neural network algorithm. The other one is a stereo vision algorithm. Uh, stereo network, and they perceive the world through a common set of sensors. In this case, this is algorithmic diversity, as an example, and not uh, uh, sensing diversity. And their job is to look up as the drone is about to descend and make sure that the sky is clear. There's a path to climb. So here's an example of uh, the network version of the algorithm looking at a flock of birds. That may happen in the world. We'd like to know that we can actually, sort of, if I had to actually go, where would I go? Okay. This algorithm works completely real time. Okay, here's another example. Um, I think that's a ski helmet looking up, right? Uh, the, and, and you're trying to see sort of uh, uh, where, if you were to climb, what is the safe cell to climb out of the location? Again, these algorithms are working in real time. And here's maybe an example of two algorithms working in parallel. So on the left, you see the stereo algorithm, and red means don't climb there. On the right, you see the network algorithm, Red means don't climb there. On top, you see the, the output of the algorithm. Like I said, lots of complexity at the bottom. The output is simple. Climb, don't climb, right? So in this case, see the neural network algorithm says you can climb over here, can climb over there. The stereo algorithm was seeing different things. You notice that sometimes it sees the sun. That's actually important because the sun, I don't know. I don't know means don't go there. This is the third, the third I, I know I don't know, right? Think about this. And this is an example of the diversity in algorithms that our system has. So this is important, both these algorithms, and again, I'm, I'm giving you like a, just one example of the way the system works. I'll, I'll do a few more. Uh, in both these algorithms have to say, go, proceed, for the aircraft to actually proceed. Everything on the, uh, on the system has to keep saying, we think, we know it's safe to go. If anyone says, I don't know, I'm not sure, system goes into a prescribed safe behavior. You've seen the middle collision alert. Okay, the, this is another one that Jeff Wilkie didn't, didn't show. So there is an aeroplane approaching us, can you see it? First person to see it, please say. Yeah, yep, okay, here's the algorithm. Now you know, it, you know where it's coming from, can you see it? That's over five and a half, uh, three and a half kilometers. And the point where you saw it was probably around now, which is about seven, 600 meters. Algorithm saw it three times longer than you did. Computers are really good at this. They don't get bored, they stir, they know what to look for. They're great at doing these boring but critical jobs. You also have to react to ground objects. Remember the crane? Well, the crane may be moved. Uh, you, know, you just can't trust that your maps are correct. So here's an example. Uh, this is a simulation. By the way, we test these algorithms both in simulation and in real-world data. It's important. It gives you both scale and fidelity. Uh, and there is this big 
uh, sort of stuck. So we would like to detect it. And here is the algorithm detecting it. Now here's the key point with these algorithms. They don't require prior knowledge. Nobody told the algorithm to look for that object over there. It says, nobody told me, I'm still looking, there is an object, I should fly away. Don't touch anything. This is the fundamental feature. Here's what, what you're actually seeing now is the uh, sensors around the aircraft uh, looking as the aircraft is descending. And what you're seeing is not the actual aircraft flying, it's the brain of the drone hang, hang under a commercial camera drone and flown uh, in an open loop way. Uh, so we operate a lot of different systems for tests, and in many cases we'll fly these open loop data collection missions. And it's, you know, you look at it like a camera, so we just get a nice camera drone. And you see how you get closer to the ground, different things get closer. Uh, one example is you can see that certain things here are dangerously close, and this one was actually too close. The drone would have aborted the delivery if it was that close. In other words, it would be pushed away from that, uh, that feature. Uh, here's another example, and this is a different algorithm. This is a neural network, or deep, deep neural network algorithm, and it's trying to find a person. It's not like a person, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, people do like to sit, you know, lie in the sun and relax, and, you know, we, we want to make sure that they can do it, and the drone will stay away. Here's a more extreme example of uh, someone who's moving around. Uh, in this case, uh, that circle is the circle that we, uh, we observe. Uh, and you'll see at some point, uh, that as the person is moving in, that the circle will turn red. Oop, the backyard just became uneligible for delivery. The person will leave it. Okay, it became eligible again. Here's an example uh, a football with a, with a child, actually a girl of someone in the room. She's, she's a star. And uh, algorithm detects it correctly. But uh, let me switch and show you exactly the same scene now in long wave IR. So this is a different algorithm also deep neural network, that now operates and detects the, the person in long wave IR. It turns out that just doing computer vision on IR imagery is not that straightforward. It requires a lot of invention. Uh, sometimes you have to find a safe landing location. There's no choice. FAA tells you, please clear the air because we decided you clear the air. Uh, local uh, medical department may say, we have to dispatch a medical evacuation helicopter in your airspace, please give us the next three minutes as we do what we have to do. We, our job is to get out of everyone's way. Uh, and the aircraft is always, based on what's perceiving around it, ready to make the decision. Let me show you an example. So what you're looking for is that little green circle. See there? The green circle is basically what the aircraft says, given what I'm seeing right now, where would I go if I'm told to land now? and we call this the unimaginably land safely now. Uh, uh, and you notice where the aircraft decided to go. It's actually pretty interesting because it's on the sidewalk, but you know, not on the street. And here's another one. I actually especially like this one because you notice there are people and then there's a fence and I'll go ahead and pick the, the, the point outside the fence. I like that a lot. That's, that's, that's a really smart decision. Now, of course, it's based on what the drone can see. It's not gonna go where it can see because it doesn't know. It may be safe, maybe unsafe. If I don't know, I'm gonna assume that it's not safe and not good. Here's another example, I like it. Look for the little green circle. Uh, it chose to go on that sort of close to the water on the dock, which is actually the right decision. Uh, but if you notice those few, few blue dots sort of hunting the water, and that's because the drone is still evaluating, says, you know, if I have to actually ditch, I may ditch in the water. That's, if that's the only safe thing I can do, that's the only safe thing I'll do. Okay, vision aid and navigation, GPS, is fantastic. You all use it every day, it's on your phone. Sometimes it doesn't work. You get close to structures, the weather changes it, um, there are now, uh, you know, people can manipulate it, right, with software-defined radios. So we want to be very robust to GPS um, outages. Uh, here's a visual slum algorithm. In this specific case, uh, you know, you're seeing a takeoff, vertical takeoff, then a transition, and because the, the sensors are oriented in sort of strange way on the aircraft, you'll see it from the side. Aircraft is flying, again, this is an A, B, flight, and what you saw that was the outbound transition, and how the aircraft uh, is tracking, the VSLAM algorithm is tracking its location purely with visual information. And you can see sort of the trajectory of the aircraft being recorded over here. Uh, so at any given moment, the GPS signal degrades, we still know where we are. We can still navigate. We can still get home, right? Here's the inbound transition, etc. Let's close with one of our mentor models. Uh, 
this is sort of maybe a takeaway uh, for the session. It's, a, it's not a new insight if you're doing machine learning, uh, but if you're new to AI and machine learning, this, this may be an important one. So the world is the ultimate random event generator. It's always gonna surprise you. And our job, building an autonomous system, is to make sure that the dawn will make the right, responsible, safe action when faced with a completely new event. And you know, you know about the black swan, Taleb, right? All credit goes to him. And black swans happen. And you need to make sure that the, your system, our system in our case, we need to make sure that they make the right decision. Uh, but what if the world is more, more sort of mischievous, if you will, right? It keeps creating these exactly once events, events that happen once but never repeat, and they keep happening again and again. What do you do then? What if your world looks like this? Can your system handle it? So that was sort of our mental model. This is the kind of system we set up to build. And the basic concept is zero day testing. As an example, we have two metrics that guide a lot of autonomy work. We call them alpha and beta originally. Alpha is the chance of a mission proceeding when it's unsafe to proceed, right? The autonomous system incorrectly misidentified something and decided to recommend that it fly forward. And beta is the chance of mission aborting when it was actually completely fine to proceed. Our job, or the job of the autonomy team in Primer, is to make alpha incredibly small, incredibly, 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 incredibly small, in exchange, making beta small enough. Once in a while, we will abort the delivery and fly home unnecessarily. That's okay, because the chance of actually making the alpha mistake is very, very, very low. How do you do it? How do you know it actually works in the real world? Okay, so you collect a lot of data, simulated data, synthetic data, real, real data. So simulated data can be an example. Here's a little simulation. The drone is flying down. There's a dog. Can you see the little dog? You simulate the world. The drone goes, oh, there's a dog there. I'm not gonna descend anymore, and I'm gonna fly away. Okay, this is a simulation. You know it works. And you collect a lot of data like that. You create synthetic data, right? So here's a little horse, and it's on an RC cart, and as the drone uh, delivers, right, we can fly it and deliver so on and make sure it's actually correct. And of course, collect real world data. That's the one I showed you before. So we know the world works like this because we actually collected real world data with our actual sensor package. Zero day testing means that you collect and generate a lot of diverse data, right? You keep a validation set to the side. You don't let your engineers look at it at all. Engineering scientists, they, they get to develop on the primary data set. But then when they actually tell you we're ready, you test the system on the data that you kept on the side, on this validation set. You test the system on data he has never seen before, because that's actually what the world is gonna do to it. Okay, I'll close now. Maybe I'll play this again. And after all this work, all this complexity, we end up with this. We had a lot of people ask us if, if this is an animation because it's so smooth. So we put this actual autonomous flight footage on the left. This hasn't been modified in any way. That inbound transition is like, Every time the aircraft does it, it's so smooth. And it's so stable, it has this feeling to it, it's just like not on like other aircraft. And I'll stop here and maybe text we have time for maybe a few questions. Thank you.